sci-fi and fantasy fans, time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies, a place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. Without further ado. All right. So welcome back to episode one. Uh, where we introduce you to Super Grunt, uh, Nick Garber, who is our our guest and soon to be, well, I guess this is his debut episode, so he is now our co-host. I, I am a co-host. Woo! Oh, welcome, welcome. And so we have Super Book Nerd Reader, Doc, uh, just regular Grunt and, and writer, me, and now we have comic book artist extraordinaire and Super Grunt, because, you know, he doesn't do anything easy way. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I qualify for super grunt. Uh, that's more Captain America themed, I think. Well, no. So I was I was leg infantry, and you were a ranger, so super grunt. That's true. I was. Uh, they they really duped me into that one. They showed me a video, and it looked really cool. And I was like, Yeah, I want to do that. And they're like, All right, cool. And, and boy, does my body hurt now in my forties. Yeah. So when when they got me into the infantry, they said I got to blow stuff up, and ladies liked the uniform. The uniform didn't do much for me, but I did get to blow stuff up. Of course, what they didn't tell you is the reverse of that is you also get blown up. Yeah, yes. yeah. No, see, I'm I went in and I'm like, this is what I want. You give it to me or I walk away. Well, the funny thing is, is that I uh, I originally was going in there to be a uh, airborne ranger medic. That That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be Doc. Uh, and they're like, well, we don't have any medic slots so we got cook and infantry and i'm like and they really tried to sell me on cook they no. tried, they sold no. me hard on cook they're like no you only cook and garrison when you're out in the field you're gonna be part of either task force black or gold which is like the search and rescue and like the protection for the battalion commander i'm like yeah i'm, I'm i'm not falling for it i i don't want to cook food i'm a horrible cook i burn that water. So that sounds yeah. like the same recruiter that tells the Cav Scouts that they're basically infantry. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you're not. I'm, I'm just going to throw it out there. I, hopefully we don't lose any uh, subscribers. But no, you're not basically infantry. You're basically a tanker. Shut up. <laughs> All right. So the first question is we're going to introduce Nick. Normally I would scope out his social medias. But uh, today – You do problem. Junior Stalker very well. I do. It's, you know, some people call it stalking. I like to call it persistence. But instead, so it's a little bit less creepy, just a little bit. We're going to let Nick introduce himself. So tell us about yourself, Nick. Okay. Uh, I'm Nick Garber. I'm the president and CEO of Apogee Comics. Uh, I am a veteran. I spent 16 and a half years in the greatest army that the world has ever produced. Um, did some really cool stuff. Deployed a lot. And... Uh, I'm really into comic books, sci-fi, fantasy, all all geek-related stuff. I'm a proud geek. Um, the the benefit is that nobody's going to try and shove me in a wall locker because uh, I can you won't take. Fit. I won't fit. Well, first of all, I won't fit because I'm very broad-shouldered, <laughs> and uh, second of all, I can fight back. So, <laughs> and no, this, I, is, this is just a sample of one of his uh, one of his drawings. He he drew that. He did the scribbles. Yes. So. We'll leave that up for a few minutes so they can ooh and ah. So, ooh, ooh ah. <laughs> All right. So, Saska, we do this every time. Since I'm going to do the evens because you're the odd one. Uh, how did you find Nick? I, you know what, Nick? I can actually say, as most people who have heard, uh, listen to sci-fi shenanigans, most of them start with, well, I was pouring booze or, well, I was standing there drinking. No, actually, I was sitting in my room and you go, Hey, I think I found a really cool person we should check out. And that's how I found it, because I'm a hermit. <laughs> so at, at one point in time when we were the other branded podcast, it wasn't as cool because we didn't do sci-fi and fantasy together. Um, so, uh, I won the fight. Chris and I realized that sometimes my life gets hectic. I have two special needs kids. And so sometimes he needed a partner to fill in if I couldn't. If I couldn't. So we're like, well, let's get a third host. And so we reached out to uh, Casey Azell and I said, hey, I need a veteran. Yeah, who that's also my writes. story of how I got here, not Nick's story. We're doing right. And, 
And his so, origin story, JR. She, his she, origin story. I'm getting there. You're interrupting. You're so rude. I really ought to make you go stand in a corner or something. Jeez. Yeah, I can look at that. <laughs> so, so, you know, we went oh. seeking it out. Well, when, when Winder walked away and we were restarting this, we said, now we need another third. And so we started looking again because we wanted to keep it veterans because that's sort of our shtick is, you know, grumpy, crazy veterans do grumpy crazy veteran stuff and we try to pretend we're normal human beings and well adjusted and well adapted it's it's all a lie uh and so i reached out to some people i knew and and i asked my friend walt uh i said i know you need to sleep because you already like only get two hours a day but do you know anybody and there's like nine podcasts already yeah i'm on some of them with him and he's like well i know this guy he's a little bit crazy maybe slightly unstable he was a ranger what do you think (laughs) And I'm like, you had me sold at slightly unstable. Like, I, I didn't even need his military background at that point. Like, slightly unstable, he's in. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I could be the normal one. It didn't I work, but I had to try. Oh, so, Lord. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Anyway, so that's how, that's how I found uh, Nick. And so we reached out and we said, hey, let's do this. And we chatted for a little bit. And then Seska said, well, just because he could type funny doesn't mean he has personality in person. So we did a test uh, um, call with you and your wife threatened to stab you. And you yeah, said, I'm not having stabby threats going on there. Yeah. And you're, and you're like, you I might like it. Down. And, no, and you were no, like, no. I might like it. And Seska was like, we're hiring him. And I'm like, okay, Seska's decided you're in. I oh, knew you already knew how to deal with crazy women. I wasn't going to yeah. go there, but oh, since thanks. you said it. No, I'll, I'll totally give credit to my wife, Marissa, for landing me this gig, threatening <laughs> to stab me during my my test, my interview. You know, she's like, <laughs> I'll stab you. And I'm like, I'm telling, I might like it. And All right. But- yeah, Anyways, he's- let's go on to the religion one. If you had to pick sci fi or fantasy first. Uh, I'm I'm a tried and true sci-fi fan. Okay. You know I, I do love both genres. Um, I would say that I lean a little bit more to the sci-fi stuff. Um, I do love fantasy. I do play Dungeons and Dragons or similar type um, games. Uh, I do enjoy the uh, the uh, um, sword and shield and monsters and. Balrogs okay. and things like that. I mean, so, JR asked me, and I'm like, I, I started on sci fi, but I'm really more about the fantasy these days. So, I mean, it takes it, all time. It, it depends, too. It's like, um, right now, me and we can be probably like, like, we're in a horror kick right now, like hardcore. Like, every type of horror movie that comes across um, my Facebook feed, I'm like, okay, we got to check this out. And then, like, we discuss it, and like, you would think we were doing a podcast about horror movies while we're watching the horror movies. You could, that could be your thing because we're just like, Hey man, this, this is really cool. Oh man. That was a really cool kill. That was a really cool premise. Wow. That really took me for a loop. I didn't see that coming, you know? Um, so every medic I've ever met loves drag me to hell. It's a decent one there. No, there's a specific scene which um, hits the medic funny bone. If you've been a medic and, done um brigade uh bct3 if you've mm-hmm. watched it you know that if any medic will know and laugh well i was cross trained as a medic i'm gonna have to re-watch that under a new set of lenses and uh <laughs> I figure it out all i know is that when i was once a pfc i was convinced by a group of medics to take an iv through my uh genitals okay that um sucker yeah you got conned the medics were having fun on you and yeah. uh, well i mean i got but, yeah it was a good time so they fed me right. booze. i was 18. crack right. the whip because otherwise this could be the uh, n- another chuck gannon length episode um star wars star trek or firefly Ooh, that's a tough one because damn you damn you doc um I'm gonna have to say overall, I'm a Star Wars guy. Um, See, and, you are into fantasy. You just like a little bit of space sprinkled in. Yeah, I, I, I like I like space Ronins is what I like. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, no, but I'm I'm a fan of all three genres or all three um, 
Not, not genres. I'll pause. Sure. Um, but all, all three franchises. That. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate that. I've been drinking. And you're going to see more of that as the shows progress. But anyway, <laughs> um, no, I'm a huge fan. I, I, I love Firefly. Um, I love Serenity. Um, I love the continuation inside the comic books that they made. Um, Star Trek gives you a hope a for the future based on like realistic technology. Star Wars, I love the fantasy aspect of it. You know, it's you know, it's 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 space token, you know. Nice. That leads well, into our speaking, next question. Speaking of token, I'm getting there. Oh wait, you That's you right. supposed to let you have a turn. Sorry. Yes, yes. So first off, we haven't decided what our what our format's gonna be for this, so you, you do get to weigh in. So for the second religion question, because you know it's fantasy too, do we say George R. R. Martin, J. R. Tolkien, or J. R. Rowling, or Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, or the Potterverse? Uh, I, I can do without Potter because the whole Potterverse is Star Wars with shitty lightsabers. Ooh. Ooh. If, if, if you send your to hang too. <laughs> I, yeah, send it to Nick Garber, uh, Nick Garber Designs at gmail.com. But send me your hate mail. I don't, I don't really care. Um, I, I don't care about your booze because I see what makes you cheer. So uh, to go completely Rick Sanchez on that. Um, no, I mean, if you, I, someone brought up to me, he's like, dude, do you ever think that like Harry Potter is like really close to Star Wars? So I go back into my brain and I'm like, okay, so I've seen all eight of those movies and, and don't get me wrong. I enjoy the movies. I enjoy the, I enjoy that franchise as well. However, comma, it's very Star Wars. It is Star Wars. I'm we now should, going to have to go back and rewatch like those. You know, you'll have to get Viking to weigh in. So that way it's homework. I was Viking a huge Potter fan. No, he's just a nerd in training. So oh, good for him. He's going to grow up and, and host a geeky podcast and all right, cool. Find out and run a convention. He's already told me. See, um, well, we, it's not comic book. He's he's into was it Beyblade and Pokemon? Pokemon. I can draw him a Pikachu Deadpool. <laughs> I, I, I could draw him a stick figure. Best I could do. Uh, he already has enough exposure to bad mouths. Mine. Um, <laughs> all right, so, but you didn't you didn't answer the question. Uh, uh, Nick. So because we're not oh, sorry, re hit that rewind button, my man. Let, let me answer it again. Bloop, 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 bloop. Game of Thrones, <laughs> Lord of the Rings, or Harry Potter uh, for your favorite fantasy franchise. I, I'm going to go with Lord of the Rings. It's a classic. I can dig it. No, yeah. the, but you got to understand the questions you're asking me. Like these are like very minor differences in how I rated them. Like I do enjoy well, them. All. They're they're all foundational properties. So yeah. since since we talked about rating and you've asked this before of other people, who is your eighth favorite comic book hero? <laughs> everyone everyone has a top three, but nobody uh -oh. takes it out to number eight. Shh, shh, hold on, I'm I'm I'm, I'm listing them. Goddamn, um, <laughs> my eighth favorite, uh, Moon Knight. Moon Knight is right. my eighth favorite. Okay. It's neck and neck between him and Electra. All right. He wins the nerd contest tonight. All right. The next yes. question is yours, Seska. Now, Moon Knight <laughs> is a solid character, and I really hope that they uh, they do a Disney Plus Marvel series on Moon Knight because I do enjoy that character. So, I don't think it's enough. Which do, what is it that you love about the science fiction fantasy genre? And it could be different things you love about them or what you love about both of them as a whole. Um, first of all, I think – um, what I love about the science fiction genre is that they, they definitely draw you in in a multitude of different directions. There's the dystopian science fiction. There's the hope for a better future. Um, you know, there's so many facets you can go in science fiction because it's all technology based, placed in the future that is either a warning to man about how things could go like Terminator, Aliens, uh, or it can start branching you off into how humanity is really going to persevere and progress through the future and better itself. So you know, against murderous AIs. Right. You know, so like you could go Star Trek or you could go like aliens, Terminator. Um, and then you have kind of the middle of the road, you know, you have Firefly, which is a huge uh, favorite franchise of mine. I'm, I'm, I'm a big Brown coat fan, you know, 
you know, you, it's like, hey, let's take science fiction, mix it with a Western, and throw in some, I don't know, some 1863 shit, you know, some Civil War stuff, you know, and there's, and I'm a student of history too, so I, I love seeing old stories brought into a modern genre or modern franchise and seeing kind of how they develop those stories. That, like, it's all in the writers, and I, and I definitely keep track of what writers are writing what. You know, uh, even though I'm not a writer by trade, I had to learn how to be a writer for uh, the comic genre. Um, and I think I did okay. I'm the world's okayest writer, I guess. <laughs> you know, if there was a coffee mug, that's what I would have. But um, Ouch. no, you know, and that's the thing, you know, like George R. R. Martin is an okay writer. He's, he's, there's nothing really long lasting or special about him. And I hope he's watching because you owe us fucking books, <laughs> you know, but he, he did spin a good tale and it got you intrigued. And I think that's really the, the point of any creator. Of We're any not going to have those books writer. until he's dead. They're already written. They're just sitting there. He doesn't want to deal with the edits. Well, shit, with his size, he's probably going to get diabetes or something. I don't know. Be nice. No. He said every time someone asks me, like, who's going to die next, he kills a Stark. Like, there's no Starks left. Like, there's fucking Bran, <laughs> you know? But, no, um, I don't even know where I was going with that. You want to hear <laughs> – real, real quick – you want to hear a funny rant about uh, Game of Thrones? Get on the podcast, The Angry Staff Officer, and watch him critique the hell out of the battle strategy in the last season of Game of Thrones. Oh, God, you you should have seen me while I was watching like the War of the Bastards. I was I was like th I was throwing shit at the screen. I didn't even I, finish it. My ex wife was like, "What is your problem?" And I'm just like, "Strategically, this is bullshit." <laughs> <laughs> and did you see he fired that. too many bullets? Where where was their where where was their fire support? You know? Where, oh my god, as an infantry officer, okay. I'm offended. I'm offended. <laughs> Back to the genre. Back, Back to, to the, the genre. genre. <laughs> okay. What was the question about the genre? I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. So, so, what is it you love? Strangely enough. I, I, I love sci-fi. Um, you know, but a close second is fantasy, and but fantasy is such a broad genre you can throw pretty much anything in there that, that that's what i probably really love about fantasy is that it could be you could throw like mad max into a fantasy you know the fantasy genre you know but mm -hmm. it could also be also be sci-fi you know so there's it, it's there's genres that um are very malleable and you can throw a lot of different things in their comic books could be considered fantasy you know um the superhero genre could definitely be fantasy i mean if you look back to the core of what superhero comics are. It's people that have an accident or they're just the wrong place at the right time and they get superpowers. You know, the, these are no different than, mm -hmm. you know, Greek mythology, you know, um, you know, you have, you have ordinary people that are blessed with or imbued with certain um, traits and powers and given a quest to save humanity, better humanity, or, you know, anything like that. So, so you mentioned super book, uh, the comic book heroes and stuff. Do you read the super comic book hero fiction, like the actual books, the literature that it's out? Uh, the actual hard like books with no pictures. Yes, the books with no pictures, <laughs> like uh, yeah, Cynthia Keke, for instance. Hey, hey, they have pictures on the covers. That's all you need, dude. No, no, like you have to be specific because there's a lot of novels that are written about comic book heroes, but they're not in the uh, sequential art style storytelling form. Um, and I do read those and some of those are, are really, really good. Um, you know, and what, what I really do enjoy about those is that it lets my mind create the art, you know? So when I read these books, uh, I've read a lot of Batman novel, you know, over the years and, uh, you know, as I'm reading them, it's like when I was younger, it was like Michael Keaton was the voice that was in my head anytime that had anything to do with Batman, you know, when I was reading a Batman novel. Um, and then like, if I was reading anything about Superman, it was Christopher Reeves, but now it's Henry Cable, you know? So, you know, as the years progress and I read new material, the voice is changing my head 
And then what really throws me on a curveball is there are certain novels out there that deal with the multiverse and you start getting all these different Batmans and Supermans and Flashes and things like that. So now I'm starting to hear different voices in my head. So as I'm reading them and uh, as a comic book creator, I'm already crazy by definition because we create speaking, people out of thin air. Oh, I'm sorry, of, Jared. Speaking of comics, can you switch out the image and we'll show another example of your art? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll give you this one here. And we'll share this guy. And yeah, there we go. And there we go. There's another example of his art. So moving on to the next question, because we ramble a little bit, but that's all part of our charm. So what's your first memory of watching um, science fiction or fantasy, reading it or playing games in the, in the, either one of those genres? What's your first oh. memory of exposure to that? Actually, my, my first memory, I was three years old. My parents went to go, they, they went to the drive and they, they, they brought me along. I was very young. Um, I think they were expecting me to pass out in the back seat. Uh, didn't happen. They were watching 10,000 BC, like a really old prehistoric type movie or something like that. Well, because it was You're, the early 80s. And, oh, uh, they did a remake of that then. Yeah. Uh, but the screen behind me was Superman. Cool. Uh, the 1978 uh, Richard Donner, Christopher Reeves, Gene Hackman movie. And I didn't care that there was no sound. I couldn't hear what was going on. All I know is that I was watching a man fly. And, and he had, you know, I was three years old. Two, 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 probably three years old. I, I really don't remember how old I was. I just know it's like two or three year old, right? But I just remember being in the back of the, uh, the car, just watching the screen and watching Superman. And I was enthralled. I was just captivated by by that whole movie, and I, I loved it. It's one of my favorites. I have the Donner cut of one and two. Um, now I'm more of a primarily Batman fan, but uh, Superman was probably the character that kind of brought me into sci-fi, fantasy, geek genre, and uh, like I was a fan ever since, you know, I was like, I, I want more of guys with capes and cowls and, and then later I got introduced to Tolkien and I got in, introduced to Herbert, you know, Dune, uh, Dune's uh, um, one of my all time favorites. Um, I can't wait for the remake. Um, I am looking forward to that one. I've seen some I, stuff on it and I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid to be hopeful on it. Yeah. Cause but. you know, as, Anybody that's a Dune fan has been disappointed before. I mean, the sci-fi series, the sci-fi channel series was pretty good. It was decent. You know, it was. Oh my uh, god, the costuming was amazing. Oh, the that that's burned in my brain is what a still suit should look like. So, a little off topic. I will force segue us into: Have you ever met one of your comic book heroes? Yes, um, in 2018. 2018, yeah. I, I met Jim Lee. Jim Lee is a, uh, a comic book hero of mine. Um, I have followed his work since 1987. Yes, just I'm a few old. years. Just a few years. Um, and I'm finally artistically at a point that he was at in 1991. So I'm a little bit behind the power curve, but I'm getting there. Uh, no, but uh, Jim Lee's work has always inspired me, and it always brought me – um, and it introduced me to other artists that are of similar style too, like Jay P or Todd McFarlane. Um, I'll throw Rob Liefeld in there too. Um, yeah, but meeting Jim Lee was probably the coolest thing because I was wearing a t-shirt of one of my characters on it. Oh, one, of the, one of the covers that I did and he was signing and he looked up and then he, he does like a double take and he goes, Hey, who's that? He like points right at my chest, like, who's that? And I'm like, uh, that's uh shit, I wasn't expecting questions. Um, that's my favorite <laughs> Phantom Hawk, and I've been drawing him since I was 12 years old, and he's 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 my guy, he's my bread and butter, you know. He's kind of like you know, the reason why I continue to draw comic books. And do you have that that character art that you can share? Uh actually I do. Uh, do I? Yeah, I do. 
Hold on. Make sure you stand up. You have pants on. He's, he's bread and butter, but he's on a gluten-free diet. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Uh, hold on. Let me bring it up. I make gluten Real jokes quick. because I have to cook gluten-free nine times out of ten. Gluten! Yeah, we we're going to watch. Uh, this is the end last night, but uh, we got sidetracked by watching something else. I don't even know what it was. Um, let's see here. Uh, Amok Origins? No, that's not right. Well, let, me, so. let me go through the stuff here. Uh, it was a cover uh, for the Volume 1 uh, Phantom Hawk Issue 4 that I had turned into a T-shirt. I, I was very proud of this piece of art. And uh, gee whiz, man. I really need to clean up my file system. I <laughs> well, we can ask another question. question. Uh, what? Uh, see here well, let me bring it up okay i found it okay see not too bad no not not too bad not, not great. everybody who can be ocd uh, i'm i'm probably getting there but <laughs> all right so there's, <laughs> there's the image oh that's cool that's nice a little bit of ant-man vibes why does it keep blurring it out sorry that's because i i minimized it but i'm a bit of a narcissist i like seeing myself on the screen but anyway so I had that turned into a t-shirt and he stopped mid signature and pointed right at the character and he's like hey who's that nice so I was like actually you're kind of the inspiration for this dude and he's like really and I'm like yeah and I'm like so if you here's my card if, if you want to set up a meeting or something that's cool I, I never got a call but anyway <laughs> it, it was so cool that I sidetracked him enough based on my artwork to me, that was a that was an absolute win. I, I think that is speaks volumes in and of itself in the art community. You know. Um, so, how did your love of drawing and science fiction and fantasy transition into you becoming a working artist? Oh, I mean, I, that was just a, a natural thing. You know, it just it just progressed naturally. It was it was the right answer. Um, something I always wanted to do was be a comic book artist. Um, how I actually got into comic books, you know, there, there were some little stints here and there. One of them was going to the drive-in, you know, and seeing Superman for the first time. But like it started even when I was in the crib. My dad, who's also an artist, didn't really pursue it to the point where I have. But he painted a mural over my crib of Shazam, Batman, Spider-Man, and Superman. Oh, so you come by it honestly. <laughs> yeah. So... Like I was already influenced from the crib of these fantastical creatures and fantastical people that were painted on a wall above my crib. Um, but when I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Wasn't Shazam the one that had um, um, Marvel and DC suing each other over it? Like, oh yeah, during the '70s, over the name of Captain Marvel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, eventually Marvel won, even though DC's character was older. But anyway. Um, yeah, so those are the things that I was I was visually influenced from a very early age about this medium. Um, what really solidified it, I would think I was like eight or nine years old. I, I, I got the flu really bad and my dad was in construction. So and this was during the winter. So um, construction projects, as long as the weather's good, he has work to do. Weather wasn't so good, so he was off and uh, he goes to Long's Drugs which is the drugstore that was in Modesto, California, Methdesto. Um, and he hit the spinner rack and he, he came home with like an issue of everything that was on that spinner rack. You know, because I didn't have a Nintendo at the time. You know, uh, so I don't think Nintendo were around yet. I'm not that old. He was I mean, rocking okay. the Atari. All right. Oh, dude, I didn't see a Nintendo until I was almost 10 because I lived in overseas. So I, it's not that you're old. It's that I have no idea when they came were in the States. They they dropped in the United States around 1986. Um, okay. So it was five, really four or five years until I saw one then. Yeah. Um, I didn't see a Nintendo until about eight, 1989. You know, when they're getting ready to transition from the Nintendo to the Super Nintendo. Um, yeah, but, but I didn't go with Super Nintendo. I went with the Sega Genesis because I wanted Sonic the Hedgehog. But uh, My mom know, said it would rot my mind, so I wasn't allowed. 
<laughs> so he bought me all these comic books and I read them and, um, and I was really staring at the artwork, you know, the artwork was really cool. You know, um, the, it is what solidified me as a daredevil fan. Cause he brings me this daredevil comic book and this daredevil fighting Mephisto, Mephisto which is Marvel's universe of the devil you know, Satan, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, know, I didn't know anything about Daredevil. So as I read this book and he got me, he got me a couple of back issues too. Um, so I'm reading this book and here's this blind Catholic kid. That's a superhero. Now I was raised Irish Catholic. So what, first of all, my religion is being represented in a major comic book. I thought that was cool. You know, um, two, a blind superhero. I thought that was super cool. You know, and then I started doing more research. The, the internet wasn't a thing yet. So I had to go to my local comic book shop and get back issues. And I told this crusty old 70 year old dude, I was like, Hey, I'm really into daredevil. I want to know more about them. Where do I go? Because it's just long box after long box of comic books, you know, and it's not like they had the Dewey decimal system, like in a library or anything, you know? So I had to, I had to rely on this crusty 70 year old dude at Bonanza books and comics in Modesto to uh, kind of guide me into where to get more Daredevil comics so I can learn more about the character. So he hooks me up. I spent probably about 30, 40 bucks that I've been saving up, blew it all on comic books. And it was, it was all, it was all Daredevil comic books. Some of them I still have. And uh, you know, I, I learned everything about the character and I've, I've been a fan ever since. I'm a huge Daredevil fan. So, um, and that just kind of like sunk me into, that was the first hook into geek culture that got me. You know, I was already a Star Wars fan. You know, um, I, the first movie I really remember seeing was Return of the Jedi in 1983 in the theater. Um, you know, so I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I've always been a huge Star Wars fan. I'm probably going to continue to be a huge Star Wars fan, no matter how bad they F it up. But, uh, Okay. So, and for those of you who don't know, the Dewey Decimal System is like Google before Google was a thing. It's pre-Google. It's the pre-Google pre -Google. categorizing Not. system that they use in libraries. I so, am sure all of our readers, all of our listeners have gone into a library. Libraries are a place that house books that you can rent, kind of like a blockbuster. Oh, my God. I'm sure they know this. Oh, my God. But that doesn't mean they're old enough to know what Dewey Decimal is. All the books in all the libraries in the U.S. use it. I'm pretty sure. And now somebody's no, they have, make it their mission to find an archaic one that doesn't. No, they have. Oh, uh, right. Most of them are using like computer systems now. But so many authors and I guess artists will tell you that they their own real life experience influenced the stories they tell. And since drawing is a form of storytelling, the question works. Were there any specific formable, uh, formidable moments for you that really shaped the kind of art you draw and the stories you tell? Ah, uh, it, it it has to be Alan Moore's Watchmen. As, as I went further down the deeper, the, the rabbit hole of comic book fandom, I, I stumbled across The Watchmen. And uh, just the way Dave Gibbons, who is the artist on that book, um, I used him as a blueprint or kind of like a, uh, a list of how I needed, if, if I was ever to be a sequential artist and tell stories in the sequential medium, that's how it needed to be. Um, and then, of course, through the rabbit hole, I start um, learning about guys like Wally Wood and Steve Ditko. And, I mean, I knew about Jack Kirby, and I started getting a little bit more into Kirby and how he told stories. And that that was very influential with me. Now I didn't start drawing sequential art until I was in my thirties, you know? So there was a lot of study, you know, between eight years old and 33 is when I, I think I released my first comic book. Um, and even then it's like, I've, I've already progressed well beyond, beyond that point. But when I decided to finally sit down and, 
be like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to draw a comic book. I'm going to write a comic book. I'm going to draw a comic book. Um, you know, so those were definitely my influences. Wally Wood, Ditko, Kirby, um, Gibbons. Um, Gibbons doesn't get enough credit. Um, so yeah, yeah, those were the guys that I really looked to, to, <laughs> to kind of like build how I was going to tell a story in, in an artistic medium outside mm -hmm. of just writing a novel. So, no. so they're laughing because I typed in the side chat that he answers questions like Chuck Gannon and David Weber do. So he always completes the circle before he gets back to the original question and answers it. <laughs> Not to say it's boring. I just, I noticed that. The we love you. <laughs> no, I love you guys too. It's, it's, it's how I tell a story. It's like, I, <laughs> I, I have your question, so. but then like all the, the images and thoughts pop into my head as I'm telling the story. And it's just like, it goes into this like loop de loo roller coaster. Oh but no, no, no. We, we go for your... what two years of doing a different podcast that uh authors and creative types do this. Yeah, we're not linear at all. No. no. So it's it's always interesting to see. Um that's why you can ask three authors in the same genre the same questions, and it's a different interview every time. It's, it's oh yeah, it makes it fun. Yeah. So we ask all of our authors and guests who are military uh, military veterans, how do you feel your time, well, specifically to you and the Rangers, helps you ha with telling a story? Um, I think it gives me a lot of personal experience into not only artistically, but literally how I, how I write things. Um, there's always that influence. The, the military doesn't leave you. At least in my no, experience, it, 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 it seeps in and it comes you know, out in like very weird places. So I understand. One of, one of the weird things, well, actually, actually, now that I think about it, it's really not all that weird. Now that I've met more military creators is that mm -hmm. we're all kind of the same in how we do shit, you know? So we, <laughs> we write our books like we're writing an op order, like everything's planned out, you know? It's like okay, so we got situation, mission. You're that Jr. You outline. You know, I, I mean, I, do, I I use sand tables to plan my battles. So, <laughs> see all these figures. Yep, I got little green army men that sit on the table. Okay, so when I write battle scenes, I play with them. No, it's work. It's not playing, and they're not dolls, Josh. They're action figures now. I, we're talking I set to them up and how I want them to look, and what they would do. So, most of my books have a military theme to them in one aspect or the other. That that's kind of like my promise to the guys that never made it home, or to the guys that did make it home but they didn't make it home complete. You know. Well, that, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, that happens. And then we don't even see when it happens sometimes. Um, right. But kind of segueing into that, have you ever drawn somebody from your time in the military into your work? Like um, as a, a, lot of, a lot of my um, support characters. Character or killed the lieutenant. We, did you ever kill your lieutenant when he was annoying in a comic? Uh, no, look on that. No, no. I, I I try to keep the positive experiences positive. Um, the, there's a lot of not saying it's not going to happen, Lieutenant Matthews. I'm looking at you. You're eventually going to be in a comic book, but uh, a lot of the support characters, supporting characters, or what did I call them before? I don't know. Support. Red we'll shirt. just call them supporting characters. They're, they're not red shirts either. Um, that that's the thing. Like all my supporting characters, they're they're more than just a sexy lampshade. You know, nice. um, we appreciate that as supporting cast. You know, um, there's been calls to action. I, don't, I I guess that's probably the best way to put it. I've gotten a lot of emails and and DMs about giving my supporting characters their own book, and I was like, you know what that. I'm totally okay with that. You know, if that's what you guys want, that's cool because the supporting characters are people that I know. Cause it's hard to create a person out of thin air. No, you know, be it isn't. Um, so 
the, so, the, the main, I guess, idea I'm trying to, tra you know, throw out there is like Phantom Hawk, which is my, my premier character. That's my premier comic book. It's my flagship. Um, there's two characters in there named Downs and Gonzo. Downs is after my buddy Fane. And it's him. He's, he's a geek. He's small in stature, but he's very ripped. He, he used to be a gymnast before he joined the military. He's got multiple combat deployments under his belt. Um, you know, and even his tattoos I put in the book on, on his arm. So like it, like, and that's what we called him. We called him Drew Downs. His name is Andrew. He, he went by Drew and he goes, no, I can just call me Drew Downs. And I'm like, all right, cool. I'm like, Hey, is it cool if I throw it on a comic book someday? And he's like, yeah. Little did he know that I was actually going to fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I made this five foot five, ripped detective in the comic book who was kind of the uh the idealist you know it's like the, the the kid reads comic books he's in the geek culture you know so when a real life superhero shows up cape and cowl you know he's all about it he's like this is the coolest thing ever i hope we get this case you know and then i throw gonzo in there gonzo felix gonzalez who is a i've known him for God damn, over 20 years, you know, we deployed together, we fought in war together, but he was supply. You know, hey, never piss off supply. They have the good. No, stuff. no. Bull bullets don't fly without supply, apparently. But uh so does that does your time in the service also influence your reading? It does. It does. Um, I, I do read a lot of military history. Um I do read a lot of military like fan fiction sci-fi stuff coming from chuck dixon he wrote a series of books about a bunch of rangers that decided to go through time and fuck shit up and <laughs> it, it, and as i was reading i'm like yeah you know, chuck you're absolutely right that's how rangers would have handled that <laughs> you know so I, i'm influenced by just pretty much everything um that goes on around me as most creatives will will claim how they're influenced, you know, cause you have to be, you know, um, it keeps your finger on the pulse on, on what's going around. So, um, probably one of my favorite things about being a creator is learning new things and being introduced to new things and new experiences and, and new genres, you know? So anytime anybody wants to drop something in my inbox, like, Hey man, you should read this. I'm like, all right, cool. I'll pick it up and I'll read it. And I'm like, all right. And, and that just adds to the, the crazy bin of potential storylines and creative influences um, that go on in my life. Okay. So we're going to transition away from all that weirdness and let's talk about things from a fan angle. So have you gotten any cool fan art or had anyone cosplay your characters? Uh, cosplay? No, but hopefully that does happen. Um, but I have gotten a lot of um, cool emails and, um, and personal messages, DMs, you know, through my various social media accounts of how I inspire people to do what they do. Um, you know, saying that me posting things and and posting drawings and my creative process process and the live feeds um, inspire people to keep continuing and pushing on with their passions, which is also drawing usually. Um, so I, 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 and, and occasionally I get an email like, Hey man, I met you in like 2013 and I bought this comic book off you and I just thought it was the coolest thing. You know, I, I get a lot of inspiring messages like that. And that's the reason why I do it. You know, if I have a story to tell, I don't care if it's like one person buys my comic book. I feel like John Grissom, you know, <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's awesome. cool. You know, so, so have, hmm. oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. Have you had a meet cute in the wild or somebody figured out who you were outside of a convention or a signing and was like, oh my gosh, I need your signature. Uh, weird thing, Ray Park. Cool. If you don't know who Ray Park is, you might know him as Darth Maul. Okay. So I, I was in the bathroom at the South Texas Comic Con in McAllen, Texas. And I was doing my thing 
And uh, Ray Park comes up right next to me, and he looks at me. He's like, "Hey, yeah." <laughs> yeah usually, you're in the bathroom. You're staring at your thing. You're doing your business. And he's like, "Hey, I know you." I'm like, "No, I know you. <laughs> you don't know me. I know you." He's like, "No, no, no, no. You got that comic book, the the the, the Phantom Bird or whatever." I'm like, holy fucking shit. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And he's like, oh, man, that's awesome. It's a good book. I'm like, how the fuck? How do you know this? Like, I'm small. Like, I'm I'm small well, potatoes. You, you know, know? When, you're, when you're talking about a scene inside in a bathroom, that's probably not the best. Yo, know, well, he's grabbing his thing. Call. I got my thing in my hand, and we're like talking to each other over the divider. Which I thought I was not allowed to talk in the bathroom. Oh, no, you're supposed to sleep. That's rule number one. Call. You don't talk, but like he like every other urinal has to be empty. Feet. So we were social distancing before it was cool. Yeah, like in the bathroom, definitely. Like there was empty stalls everywhere, and he'd like Whoop, right next to me. <laughs> He's like, hey, man, do you have a table here? And I'm like, yeah, I do. And I gave him the table number. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. But he's like, hey, man, I'm going to stop by. I want a signature. And I'm like, by the time you come over there, I'm going to whip up a Darth Maul drawing. And I want you to sign. He's like, all right, sounds cool. You know? So next thing you know, fucking Darth Maul is at my table. And he's like, hey, I'll take this one. I'll take this one. I'll take this one. He's like, he bought like. Like thirty dollars worth of books off me because that's all I had at the at the, hand, at the time because I, I hadn't put out that much I was just starting and uh, so I signed them on like two Ray best Nick Harbor you know and handed them off and then I had that a really quick sketch of Darth Maul and he's like oh man it's awesome it looks just like me and I'm like dude sign it he was like. 30 bucks. And I'm like, fuck you, 30 bucks, really? And he's like, no, I'm just kidding. And he signs it. And it's in here somewhere in this mess. It but, should be framed in that mess, just to let you know. I don't know. Jim Jim got first billing on the framing coordination. So uh, at one point <laughs> in time we got the really nice view of his whoopee, but it, it it fell. No, it's still there. Okay. Well he changed it on the camera. So. And you just can't see it because it's a camo whoopee. That uh, I, have a, that I have a big freaking head. So this is true. This is true. So we will move on from that awkwardness, and I will say, <laughs> have you ever spotted anybody out in the wilds reading one of your comics? Uh no, but I do have a cool story about someone recognizing one of my tattoos, which are all my characters, while I was traveling. So I got this tattoo right here, which is Bengali, the demon of San Diego. He's one of my central characters. Okay, so I had I was getting ready to move out to San Diego. I was I had a layover in Dallas for about three or four hours. So I went and decided to get something to eat and a couple of beers as I waited. Um, the only table that was available was this like long, like kind of like common company family style type table that they just kind of sat people next to. So I go in there like, hey, all we have is this table line. That's cool, man. I just want a burger and a beer and I'll be on my merry. So I'm sitting there and I'm waiting for my food. I'm messing around on my phone. And the guy next to me is like, hey, dude, is that Bengali? I'm like, what would you say? I'm sorry. He's like, dude, is that Bengali? I'm like, yeah, that, that's absolutely Bengali. And he's like, oh, man, I backed that Kickstarter, man. I love that comic book. It was like pure 90s goodness. I'm like, oh, that's cool, man. I, that, yeah, I, I feel the same. You know, I, I, I love that book. I love the style of the character. I love how he looks. And he goes like, dude, I'm a huge fan. I can't wait for the next one to come out. I'm like, all right, cool. He's like, I, I don't mean to bother you. I'm like, no, that's totally fine. I'll talk Bengali all day long because he's mine. <laughs> but, uh, um, so his girlfriend or fiance. No, this is where the story gets good. So his girlfriend comes out of the bathroom. She's like, hey, this guy's got a Bengali tattoo. Remember that Kickstarter book? She's like, oh, yeah, I totally love that book. And I'm like, oh, do you? And she's like, so the guy's like, you must be, a, are you a fan? I'm like, yeah, you could say that. I'm a fan. And he's like, you must be. You got him tattooed on your arm. And I'm like, well, it's because I'm his creator. And he's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm Nick Garber. I'm, I'm the creator of Bengali. And he's like, holy shit. Really? And I'm like, yeah. Um, so I bring out my phone. I show him pictures. You know, it's like, this is all the stuff that 
you know, I've done for Bengali. And he's like, oh my God, this is awesome, dude. So like, he's like, babe, you got to take a picture. I got, I got to take a picture with the creator of Bengali. So I'm like, you know, I, I'm not used to this. This is the first time that has ever happened to me. Aww. You know, someone to recognize one of my characters and, and just give them high praise like that. So, um, you know, we, we talked, he paid for my lunch, which was really Aww. awesome. So I, I didn't get your name. I apologize if you're watching, thank you for the lunch. It was amazing. And, uh, you know, thank you for your fandom. So, you know, that, that was probably the coolest thing. I, I've never seen people, I mean, outside of a convention that have already purchased the book. You know, I've seen those people read my books, but like to be out into the wild, into the real world outside of the convention circuit, that that was really cool. So you know. our next question typically is, what is the craziest interaction you've had with a fan? But that's hard to top. I would have to say that's probably the craziest interaction to answer yeah. that question. It was just, uh, I was awesome. It, it was just an awesome experience. I was on cloud nine the rest of the day and the day's preceding that you know it's like to to have somebody recognize your work outside of a confined type of environment like a convention you know um to see it out what i call in the wild um a totally different experience you know i i, I just i was so humbled by it that somebody actually cared enough about something i created and recognized it and wanted to have a discussion about it. you know so i gave him some insider stuff of what we planned for the future of bengali and uh you know he walked away on cloud nine i walked away on cloud nine and, you know, and was, everybody was happy everybody was happy aside from bengali and um phantom hawk what other properties have you you created uh Solarum prime which is our Cosmic Hero, um, who's going to be coming out later this year. Uh, the Crimson Paladin it used to be called the Crimson Guardians, with uh, the central character being the Cardinal. Um, I those are characters that I've created and put a lot of. I mean, these are all characters I've created when I was, you know, little. I was like 12, 13 years old when I created these characters, and I started finally developing them. Um, Cardinal, I create, I developed with Ray Merrick because um, he was meant to be a B list character, B C list type character. It was something that was left in a drawing, like a, a, a sketchbook that I had years ago. And he wanted to make a comic. I'm like, all right, cool. Well, I don't want to do any of my major properties, but maybe we could do something with one of my, you know, B list or C list type guys that I've drawn. And we went through the, the drawing books of characters that have not seen the light of day yet and he's like how about that cardinal guy because he's from st louis so cardinal and he's like let's do that i'm like all right cool so we did a youtube series for about a year as we were developing it and uh it became one of our our biggest sellers uh for apogee i think it brought in like almost five grand on a kickstarter so that was really cool it's that probably is... one of my one of my favorite characters that well my favorites get tattooed on me. That's so Bengali. Oh, I, I have Bengali, I have Cardinal, and I have Phantom Hawk on my shoulder. This Phantom Hawk was done by Jay Lee. Um, so what was what is your favorite comic that you haven't read, written? So somebody else's comic that you've read or Oh, oh wow. ruled over. Um, Whatever, however, you absorb comics. Uh, v for Vendetta is a fan. Of, I, I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, the Watchmen. Those are both Alan Moore books. Um, uh, I'm a huge fan of Batman as well. Uh, the Long Halloween is probably one of my. I, I I I really find trouble in like one, two, three, like ranking them. It's like because okay. I just enjoy. Them. So I, I got like a pool of like 10 books that so I just I what is it that agree. makes those stand out for you? Uh it's mainly the storytelling. It's the uh the in-depth nature and how they go into the character's psyche and how they mm -hmm. evaluate and 
um, their decision making. I still think of things in like a military aspect. Like, so a lot, what I love about those books is that they go really into the internal psychology of the central character and it gives you an in-depth look of how they operate, how they view the world, how they see things. Um, and once you can establish that, and it's one of the things I, I find hard as being a comic book writer and a comic book creator, is that I, I don't feel personally that I've been able to achieve that level of interaction between the character and the audience. Um, I think I do an okay job to get readership, but mm -hmm. to have that, that level of, as a reader, just be completely involved in where you almost feel like you're the central character, like you're the person there, you're sitting mm -hmm. in the driver's seat. Um, I, I don't think I've achieved that yet. And that's what I love about a lot of the books that I listed. Uh, Frank Miller is also a huge inspiration for me and in how he writes a story. His artwork is is good, but his storytelling is always better than his artwork. Um, and for those of you who don't know who Frank Miller is, uh, The Dark Knight. Um, okay. Remember, three I don't even know how to read a comic book right. Is there no, a difference between a comic book, a graphic novel, and the, the anime manga? Even I don't know there's a difference, and it's called a manga. I don't okay, know um, what the difference is, but I, always, but I do know there are. Simple answer, the difference between a comic book and a graphic novel. A comic book is a continuing series, usually. Uh, your graphic novel is a long story, a one-shot, as we call it in the business. Uh, in the business. I thought they were just omnibuses. No, that an omnibus is a collection <laughs> of uh, sequential issues that are break, broken up into story arcs. Okay. So, like, you take a book like 30 Days a Night. Mm -hmm. I see this class overlooked. Nobody knows who 30, 30 Days of Night is. Um, 30, 30, 30 Days of Night uh, was a vampire book. And, and it's a graphic novel. It's a one shot. It was never meant to be anything other than that. Even though there are sequels to it. There are sequel okay. graphic novels to it. So it's broken up as a enclosed story Um so there's a beginning and an end, and at the very end, there's no to be continued or to be seen. So it's a freestanding piece of work. It is. So okay. That, that's, that's probably the basic way to explain what a graphic novel is. Um, and it does get confusing because you'll you, a lot of publishers will take collections of work and put them in a trade paperback, which looks like a graphic novel, even though it isn't. So they took mm. sequential comic books of a story arc, piece them together and put them into a book. So it, it, there's kind of an argument of like whether that quantifies as a graphic novel, but it really isn't. It's just, it's a collection of, before you start getting to the omnibus type stuff, you know, you have these smaller collections and trade paperbacks. That makes sense. Okay, so we asked you about your favorite comic book, but what about your favorite main character? Uh, who is who is it? Someone you didn't draw. Who is your favorite? Oh, Daredevil, hands right. down. And what makes him <laughs> unique in the crowded world of? We already of, covered that one. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll reiterate. Like what what I really loved about Daredevil and his backstory, and I'll get a little bit more in detail with it, is that um, based on his backstory, he should have been a villain. Like all the trauma that he endured as a child could have easily pushed him into being a villain, into falling onto the wrong side of the tracks and being on the wrong side of the law. But he didn't. He went the other way. you know. And I think that's mostly based on his religion, being raised a strong Catholic kid. You know, it's like, okay, well, you know, as Catholics, we're used to being shit on and going through hard times and just going through all this trauma, you know, I'm going to go the other way with it. Or a lot of people don't. And I think that's what I find most intriguing about the character yeah. is that he decided not only does he want to fight crime as a, in a as a costumed hero, but he wants to fight it in the court of law as well. Yeah, because wasn't Daredevil originally written when um, Irish Catholics were not really well accepted in the local communities? Right. Uh, Daredevil came out in the oh. late 60s. Um, so we're mm -hmm. still getting past the whole Kennedy 
empire of politics, you know, where the mm -hmm. biggest concern with Kennedy was that he was an Irish Catholic kid and he, they thought that the Pope was going to have more influence in American politics. There's a whole lot of stuff going yeah. on during that time. I, know. I think it was a really I mean, big I risk for them to produce that character. I, know I my really grandmother. loved watching Daredevil because the first experience I had with Daredevil was as a movie, but I grew up in a family with disabilities. And it was really nice, neat to see a character who was that disability also worked out as their superpower in a way. And that was really awesome to see right. growing right. up. And um, so. That's one yeah. of the things that really sold me on the character was that disability that he didn't use it as a deterrent of how he could live his life. It actually accentuated how he could live his life. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I say, yeah, yeah. My uh, German grandmother told me that during World War II, it was harder to be a uh, Roman Catholic than it was to be a German when we were fighting them. So, <laughs> in right. America, uh, okay. there, there was a there was a period in American history where uh, Catholics were looked down upon, like we not were well we were received. Low, yeah, we were not well received, and we're still not really well received. You know, um, and for good reason. You know, I'm not going to say the the Catholic Church is the is all be all of of religions. We've done some really messed oh. up shit. I mean, responsible for the Crusades. However, but going back to Daredevil, I that. <laughs> so you like so seeing things. yourself in it? Oh uh, yeah, you know, like I I do enjoy being represented. You know, it's I'm I'm already a white guy. I know I'm representing about ninety percent of comic books, but to to have that represented representation based on my religion, I I think was well. And Dar really most me. of the comic books really stayed away from religion, and um, so Which Daredevil was wasn't Marvel, it right? was unusual yeah. that Daredevil yeah. was. Though I do remember a lot of um, Catholic mafia. There was. It was Irish Catholic Mafia to, you know, so, which I do have, I had family members that were part of that organization, uh, you know, so well way back. But how about, what's your favorite villain? Is your favorite villain kind of like that? Like what makes that person your favorite villain too? Ooh, that is a phenomenal question. I, wow. <laughs> Uh-oh. My favorite villain. IRS agent number 24. No, it's just IRS agent talking to me. No, no, no. I threw him off a cliff. Um, <laughs> I am Sparta. My favorite, <laughs> my favorite villain. I think we broke I, his mind. No, because there's so many. I, like, I'm going through the database right now, and it's nothing more than monkeys in a warehouse right now pulling out a file. Like, what did you say? Oh, my God. We. Because okay. we have a favorite villain, but this? Jesus. How about this? We'll make you answer it. it. Maybe if we do a ask anything, think of it by then. And we'll if we do one of those, we'll uh... I I mean, at, right now, my, my favorite villain, I would have to say, is Dr. Doom. Okay. Dr. Dr. Doom is one of my favorite villains. Um, I... I I just love his look. I love his dynamic. I, I love his motivations. Um, but I'm sure I have another favorite coming up. So if they do, if we do and ask me anything, uh, I'll, I'll have a better answer by then. Okay. Right now, I'm just going to say Dr. Doom. All right. Well, we don't want to take forever because I hear your dinner is getting cold. So before we let you go, is there anything you want to tell us about you, Nick Garber, comic book extraordinaire uh, that we didn't ask already? Uh, that's what I can think of other than I'm very approachable. So if you ever see him on the street, <laughs> come up and say hi. I, I do love interacting with people that enjoy my work. Um, and... By all means, uh, reach out to me on social media. Uh, if you like my stuff, you like it. If you hate my stuff, let me know what you hate about it. You know, that's, that's how I make these Be things. Be constructive with it, guys. Uh, I mean, I feel like being constructive is I mean, it's, it's totally fine. Um, so saying that, though, the reaching out to you, how do they reach out to you, Nick? You're gonna, you can reach out to me and, oh, my God, I have so many social medias. Okay, so you can find me on Facebook, obviously. Um you can find my art page at Nick Garber Art. Um, you can find my company page 
at Apogee Comics. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram with at Ned Gerber Art or at Apogee Comics. And that's pretty much it. Oh, also, if you would like to purchase some of my comic books, um, if you want, if you've got a little extra coin, you want to throw it at your Witcher, you can find me at www.apgcomics.net. And uh, usually we, we when you order something, we, we get it out within a couple of days. But we're pretty good at that. And so if you can, you can find us and we will link on our links to his as well. So that'll help. Uh, but you can find us on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters, tack and tack blades, anchor FM blasters and blades. Our Twitter is at uh, SF underscore fantasy underscore show because all the cool stuff close to our podcast name was taken uh our email is blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com all three of us can can see that if you want to reach out blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com we have our blasters and blades facebook group uh facebook.com backslash blasters and blades podcast and you can support the show at uh, buymeacoffee.com backslash author jr hanley and when you have the comment section put podcast and it goes to cover expenses of the show um and we will link to everything that is nick garber on our youtube which right now if you just go to youtube and you search blasters and blades you'll find us but because we don't have enough people who have liked subscribed and followed us it's just a string of someone vomiting the alphabet with the few yeah. numbers thrown in so the best jr thing- i I almost wore my KTF T-shirt for this. I, I would, I, I would have liked that. I, I think the Emperor, <laughs> uh, Jason Ansbach and Nick Cole would have approved. Yes. Uh, Pay Caesar right. that which is Caesar. That is right. What, so, what are you guys reading? Is anybody else reading anything right now, or is it just me? Uh, I'm rereading Galaxy's Edge, the first novel from. Oh, uh, the nice. I am uh, listening to the pre-release copy of Forgotten Ruins by the same authors, Jason Onspock and Nick Cole, which is basically <laughs> like a uh, U.S. Army Ranger regiment gets sucked into Tolkien meets World of Warcraft meets uh, D&D. Oh, that, that sounds amazing. Awesome. We would definitely mess things up. <laughs> so I have just finished reading Gunrunner by Larry Correa from Bain Publishing out this month. Very good book. You will love it. He's my favorite midget. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling being a co-host, I'm gonna my my literal my literary selection of what I'm gonna have to read is gonna increase tenfold. Sometimes that's people even give us free books, so we'll review it. That's so okay. That's I read I mean. fast. I'm a speed reader, and I I do love reading, so it gives me See, so much I, to do. I listen, but if you tell a narrator that you listen to their book on like 1.5 or something, and not at the normal speed, they look at you kind of funny, and their hair starts standing on end, and then they get that little twitch in their eye, and then oh, it's wow. like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't tell them. Uh, I I can't say anything. I read as much as I can find the time to, and uh, I listen to about 20 plus hours of audiobooks a week. Yes, but do wow, you listen you to it at normal speed or do you listen to it at like sped up a little? Normal speed. I'm not brain damaged like that. I, I got a spinner rack of indie comics that I'm still trying to get through. All right. Well, we have been at this for an hour. His food is going to get cold and his wife might actually stab him if he misses dinner. And we couldn't have that. So thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. <laughs>